this is an ITF meeting, so it's being uh, the note well applies, it's being recorded, and if you know anything about any IPR uh, related to this, either uh, talk to us about it or don't say anything at all. Um, you've all, hopefully all by now seen the link to the minutes. Um, please fill in your names there. Um, this is the first time I'm doing this in a role as uh, as working group co-chair moderating this. Um, one administrative point I'd like to bring up is to congratulate uh, Francesca on having on being the next um, area director for us, taking over from Barry. So thanks, Barry, for doing this in the, for the time um, you've done it. And welcome, Francesca, and congratulations in your role, which unfortunately mm. also means that I which unfortunately also means that I will need someone else to join me in chairing this. Uh, Francesca is nice enough to spend some time here um, until kind of things are settled in. But yeah, we're looking for for someone um, to join us here. Um, the first thing on the agenda is uh, working group document status. Um, this should be rather brief since there is now a dash 04 of OID uploaded by Carsten, I think, today. Um, the only thing that's keeping this in the working group, given that it has passed the working group last call, is the, um, is the IPR statement from the other author. Um, once this is good, then um, Francesca and I can complete the Shepard review and basically being ha I'm handing over the thing to me because otherwise Francesca will have to do gymnastics in case she would um, um, miss miss um, miss out on on pushing on on letting this go forward. Um, the other things, the other topics for today are working um, implementation survey. This is something that Michael um, can then say a bit about it. Um, basically, a follow up from the last meeting. And the other topic that's not on the agenda yet, <clears throat> but came in on short notice, is pack Seabor, with potentially, if we have time for it, the third item of um, the other mail Carsten sent in, and I don't find on my screen right now. <laughs> Um, they also submitted, but it's discriminated. Um, you. I also submitted yeah. some additional slides. So yeah, if we on discriminated here, unions. Yes. Um, Michael, do you want to um, start ahead on the on the general topic of the of the survey? Um, sure. Um, sorry, just give me one second. Sorry, just every phone rang at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you know, I have a slide, so let me put let me uh, put it on if I can. Um, yep. <clears throat> okay, so this is really the crux of what I'm thinking about is that um, um, that this is something that. Uh, I'd like to go on cebor.io. Uh, I think if, you know, Karsten agrees, I don't think this is intended to be an RFC, um, but maybe maybe we would want to draft part of it uh, in the form of an internet draft. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't, I mean, we could go out and ask people with a survey or Google Docs, but I, I'm thinking, uh, um, uh, just interview, um, ask to fill in, um, fill in template. Um, so, so what's the purpose of this in my mind? My mind is that um, when I went through to pick some implementations a couple weeks ago uh, to work to work with, I found that um, I, I I really had to get well. I'm going to say very deeply into uh, implementations. Um, there's quite a few, some languages have quite a few implementations, um, and they're really not all equivalent. Um, so just to give the group an example, um, the, there's a Rust implementation, which is based upon 
uh, the rust serialization and deserialization mechanism known as SERDI. Um, and you'd think it would be great since it's, it supports all sorts of other things like JSON and message packer and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but it turns out it doesn't support tags. Um, and then it turns out that in addition, um, it's really only suitable for serialization of um, structures uh, that you've defined in Rust that you want to serialize to Seabor or something else. And then you want to serialize them back. So if you made a video game in Rust, let's say, and you wanted to make a save file, a self-describing save file, um, and then you're going to reload it later on, this would be a great thing because it would allow you to uh, serialize any structure that you could define in Rust. Um, but the results would be in some uh, Rust-defined CBOR protocol, right? So if you tried to build a CDDL for it or something like this, you probably would find that it was unstable, but it's self-describing, so it would... I don't know what happens when you upgrade your game. I don't know if you wind up with free upgrades to your save files or not. Um, but in any case, if your purpose was then to send the save file across the internet and reload it into a version written in C Sharp, you're probably out of luck because it probably doesn't have any kind of stable uh, facility. So that's that's the kind of thing that I would like to get into the survey. Um, I've also been through a couple of C implementations because I actually have some C code and some Rust code that need to interoperate. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so I, I kind of went down some of the same uh, space again. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is kind of describe these. Not I don't want to judge them because they have different purposes. Um, but I think it's really important for us to understand um, yeah, there's a lot of implementations out there, but in fact, in some cases, there's six implementations, none of which do what I think that many people in this working group would expect them to do, because they all cover a different, a different, uh, different part of the elephant, if you know the analogy. Um, um, so I think that part of the things that we're part of the questions I would I intend to ask is so, for instance, like tags. For instance, does that um, um, uh, are they uh, is it intolerant of tags? Um, meaning they break. That sound would be bad. Optional. Um, um, core tags only. Uh, that's probably the wrong word to use here. Um, RFC uh, 8949 tags only. Uh, user defined tags. Um, um, and some implementations are tolerant but they don't give you tags, but no user interaction. So you put whatever tags you like, but it just, it doesn't do anything with them. It just skips them. Uh, no, how about no API interaction? So that's something that I, that I think is very different among things. Another, another one is, is floating point, for instance. Um, it can be um, uh, supported, uh, mandatory, <laughs> um, uh, optional, um, and then we have, um, you know, half versus full uh, or double, I guess, uh, uh, support. Um, so, for instance, many embedded people, they may say, I have no use for floating point. I'd really like to be able to compile it out. And some, some uh, libraries, this is not a problem. And some of them, if you don't use any floating point, well, then the, the code is arranged such that the linker probably doesn't include any. Um, and others don't have that problem. You have to explicitly compile it out. So that's something I would like to, to get at. Um, and then there's I, there's a lot of, of, of variability in decode. We obviously have pull parsers that people have described. Okay. Um, we have SACS like parsers where you bit, get a callback per thing. Um, and then we have ones that are like get next object. Um, and then we have ones that uh, uh, roll your own, right? So they, uh, they basically provide decoders for all the major types. And uh, that's it. You push and put it together yourself uh, in your own code. And, and, and there's some good reasons to do each one, um, but that's there. I don't know how if, if to describe SAX parsers to, in a way to someone that doesn't know what SAX is. I don't know if someone has some ideas about that. Well, they're usually called event type 
pauses. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So that's my idea. Um, and I, I would appreciate some feedback as to what direction here. And uh, um, if I'm captured what I, or if I explained it well enough to other people to, uh, so that you understand what I had in mind. So I think that uh, <coughs> what, <coughs> excuse me, what you just said is a pretty convincing demonstration that we actually need to write that draft first. Um, and that okay. draft will simply define terms for these different categories of implementations. So you, you know that what the non-allocating parser is and, and what an allocating parser is and you have DOM and, and event and pull type parsers and, and so on and so on. And then based on that draft, uh, we can actually do a survey and, and ask people, where, where do you put your implementation? Or is your implementation maybe something that, that really requires uh, modifying that, that draft once more? Okay. So, uh, so basically, we're gonna so we're gonna write the draft uh, with the things. Ask people to self-identify, and and tell us where we're missing uh, critical bits there. That's my proposal. Yes. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. The other thing I want to ask um, is uh, I want to know what to do with with implementations where um, they where I don't get responses. Um, or where, uh, like there are there are what appear to be sometimes active GitHub code repositories with pull requests that are say less than six months old, um, but no actual activity for more than that time. So in other words, there's people that that would like to contribute to it, but they aren't they aren't able to, um, and um, that's a uh, uh, I, I don't know what to do. Do we leave the, the results blank? Uh, do we fill them in the best that we can think of? Uh, do we ask somebody else that may be involved if they would like to fill them in? They may say, gee, maybe I should become the maintainer. Um, I don't want to mark implementations dead when they're just, you know, sleepy or they've served their purpose or something or um, there. Um, again, in the Rust space, there's a kind of, uh, I've realized it's a, uh, um, a closed pointer loop um, of please don't use this implementation, use that one. <laughs> and you go around the loop and you realize that that it's not going to work. You have to pick one of them or you have to make your own, I guess. Um, so I don't know what to do about that uh, as far as, um, uh, you know, from a political point of view. I want to be inclusive but I also don't want to put inaccurate or dead information into this. Well, I mean, we, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Francesca. Okay, we, we can list them and we, without putting, um, if we don't get any response, we can still list them and not list what features they have. Yeah, so we kind of have that on, on Cber IO already, right? We have a list of things, and we don't have a necessary. We have a half paragraph, um, so we already kind of yeah. have that. Yeah, I don't see a better solution. I mean, it's in the implementer implementer's interest to to answer this survey. Um, yeah. So I hope that it doesn't happen too often that we don't get responses, but we, I don't think there's much more we can do, right? For for projects um, that have a public issue tracker, we could ask for we could ask about the about data from them on that issue tracker, so that we at the same time reach the original author, but also reach other parties that are interested in keeping this alive and um, and are possibly considering stepping up as maintainer or doing something about that. So I'll post basically the. If I can't get a, I may just in many cases post an issue to, and and to seek out the maintainer that way, um, and ask them if they could you know this. One of the questions I have is, are you on the mailing list? <laughs> um, Great question. 
Good. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and and if not, why? Um, the other part is, you know, maybe they would say, well, I would love to have like a, a, a blog that I follow or I would like to have a announce list or I don't know what. Um, so I, I think that's something I'm, I'm interested to ask them for that part. And I, I think it's a valid question to ask. Uh, how to format this? So survey like the monkey one or Google Doc or, yeah. So, so if... I think I just put the template for the moment into the internet draft that we just proposed. Um, and then um, um, I, I, I'm thinking that it's, that it's just a, a page. I, I'm thinking that it's really should be a page per her implementation um, that way they could actually even throw it in their source code if they want to. Um, um, yeah, and... but I think something more dynamic will get people to answer more. Yeah. If you have okay. Google survey or, or yeah. So I don't know how don't... to use those, but I, 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 uh, I my school I board throw those at the... me all the time. The secretariat could help us. We, we had a survey. We're starting to talk about surveys um, for the CDDL features work we did with Jim. Yeah. So I could uh, find more info about that. So what, one thing we could do is um, when we have this draft, we could uh, use the GitHub repo for this draft and open the wiki uh, feature and simply start <clears throat> creating a, a page, a wiki page per implementation and uh, fill in our misunderstanding of what that implementation does and, and then point uh, the authors to that and say, if there's anything wrong, could you please do that? Um, so if you need an answer on the internet, you first generate a wrong answer and then, then you get the answer. Um, yes, exactly. Okay. Um, which law is that? I can't remember. Cunningham's law. Thank you. So we, we would simply make gonna, those. I was going to wrote. I was going to post the wrong answer and see if someone would correct me. <laughs> we would simply make those seventy-five uh, pages from the ones that are on seaboard.io and uh, start filling them in a little mm -hmm. bit, maybe based on what what we actually know. And okay. then wait for things to actually update those wikis. Okay. So um, then probably just mark down. Yes, like, like GitHub wikis are. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't have anything else to more to say on this. Um, Already sounds like we, a good plan. Will you do start the terminology draft? I will start the terminology draft. Great. Thank you. Any more comments on, on this topic? Ideas that we should we should consider now um, before things get actually started? Then I'd like to move over to the next topic of the agenda, that is Pact Cibor. Um, we've briefly talked about this in the last interim. Um, Carson, the floor is yours. Right. Um, do you may want to use one screen per slide? And, and not um, I'm trying. I'm not sure. Um... <laughs> anyway, not, not that important. I just hate it when things go yes. uncontrollably in front of me. Okay, so th this is an update uh, on on the CBOR pack discussion we have had at the end of October uh, in the interim. So this took a full three months to ripen, but I think it actually is much more ripe now uh, th than it uh, would have been if we had uh, th th tried to do it faster. So um, I have submitted the Dasher 1 today 
Um, did anybody read that? Um, yeah. yeah, half, half, halfway. Good. Okay, so uh, basically, th there was lots of editorial stuff that that had to be fixed, and and terminology that needed to be defined, and so on. Um, but I think the the most important uh, change between zero zero and zero one is that uh, the draft now has a clear split between the unpacking operation, which is really the part that that needs to be rock solid and standardized and be part of of as many SIBO libraries as possible, and the table setup part that will always be a little bit more application specific and uh, we will have some application specific static dictionaries and, and all that stuff. So the, the intent with the current draft is to, to have a clear separation uh, between those two. Um, the other uh, <clears throat> changes which are uh, in part quite significant have to do with adding suffix packing Oh, uh, zero zero only had prefix packing, item sharing, and prefix packing. So we now have added suffix uh, packing and are calling the whole thing affix packing if, if we don't care whether it's prefix or suffix. And uh, the other thing is that uh, both for suffix and for prefix packing, we specify how to apply them to containers. So in, in zero zero, it was only for strings, and it now also covers arrays and maps. So th this is the, the other big construction side, which is kind of orthogonal to, to the split uh, thing. So um, th they, they are not really influencing each other very much. Um, so the, the zero zero started with defining what a packed CBA, uh data item is. And a one simply defines one of potentially many future table setup tags, which are called basic packed zebra. And um, the, the, there is also some text, which probably needs to be expanded a lot about application specific and explicitly tagged additional uh, setup. So this is not meant to be the one and only tag. And th that's why it, it moved to one plus one space. Uh, also, but it's the one that people can start with if they don't have application-specific requirements that, that would uh, uh, make you want to do something different. So that's an overview. Next slide. So adding suffix packing is, is uh, well, kind of obvious <laughs> what you need to do, uh, but uh, doing this in, in a naive way would mean that we we allocate the same number of tags we have allocated for the prefix part, for the suffix part. And th that creates a little bit of cognitive dissonance for me. Um, and my hunch is uh, that uh, prefix packing is actually way more important than suffix packing. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to be corrected on this. Uh, so I know that, that you will have .html suffixes and something like that, but uh, maybe that's not really the, the main purpose of, of the uh, CBOR uh, packing. So maybe we want to allocate more of our tag space to the prefix part than to the suffix part. The, the disadvantage of doing that is that the, the arithmetic for... for uh, um, doing the the various tag ranges and so on becomes different between prefix and suffix packing, but that that's maybe a small price to pay. And since we are really unlikely to allocate more than one one plus zero tag for this, uh, we already have to decide where where that goes. And assuming that it goes into the prefix um, a case, uh, that will already define a difference between prefix and, and uh, suffix packing. So th th there are lot, lots of uh, not so interesting, but detailed and, and in the end probably important uh, decisions that, that have to be made here. 
And I'd rather do those based on a corpus than, than based on hunches. So uh, creating a corpus of, of uh, CBOR data items that we want to work well with uh, CBOR packing is probably an important uh, next step. So if there are no direct uh, comments on this, let's go to the uh, container affixes. Um, strings are a lot like arrays, so it, it's pretty much obvious what you do for arrays. But if you want to provide container affixes for maps, uh, well, the first observation is that maps are unordered. So, so prefix and suffix uh, 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 packing are actually the same thing for maps. Um, and uh, the second question is, um, how do we handle keys that turn up both in the affix and in the rump, in, in the <clears throat> uh, thing that, that is in, in the packed structure that, that says what uh, other things need to be in the combined map than, than what's already in the affix? And uh, we, we could simply forbid that. Uh, which I think would be a, a missed opportunity. Or what, what Desha1 uh, proposes is to have an override uh, feature here. And that's actually a place where prefix and suffix packing could differ. <coughs> and I, I, <coughs> I will, or we could use the bit that, that is uh, uh, available here between prefix and suffix uh, packing. And we could say that that one of them, in one of them, the rump overrides the affix, and in the other one, the affix overrides the rump. Um, so the 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 bit distinguishing prefix and suffix is kind of attractive, and and this uh, tries to to give it a good use. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think both will find. Uh, use in, in practice. So it, it's probably a good idea to have both. Um, what the, the current proposal doesn't have is a way to remove entries, because that, that would open another can of worms, and, and uh, uh, I tried to keep that can closed. Brief question on, on having both cases. Why would one ever have a case where the suffix should override the rump rather than not having the data item in the rump in the first place? Because the rump may actually be constructed from from other things that, that in turn are shared items uh, and so on. Um, so if, if, if you have a, a rump that, that is entirely spelled out, uh, that would be weird. But given that the, the rump may itself be something that has <clears throat> references to shared items and, and even maybe to, to other affix uh, compression, um, it's probably a good idea to be able to override things that are in the rump. I see. It will just need ver some very careful spelling out because that's definitely not obvious. <laughs> Yeah. Imagine you had a, a Seaboard protocol that was processed it through a series of steps. It starts off really well compressed, and then you know things get changed in the data in the in the rump, and at some point it turns out the rump the compression provides no value whatsoever, and that's unfortunate. But it but it was cheaper to do that than bother fixing the rest of it or figuring it out. I mean, you could remove all the compression, but you still don't know because you haven't gone full, completely into the you haven't descended through all the parts of the data, right? You've just edited some of it. And, and as each part gets edited, some uh, compressed pieces get removed. This this does bring up memories of um, FBI documents that are have um, PDFs that are blacked out selectively. And <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no removal at, at the current point in time. Yeah, so again, this would be one place where the prefix variant is the more likely you will be using, and the suffix is really not that likely. Um, but uh, I still think it's useful to have the, the um, FX, <coughs> FX overrides uh, ramp 
uh, case as well. But let, let's verify this from the corpus. <laughs> if we can't find a good example for that, then maybe we don't use, need to support that use case. Any other questions on container affixes? Yeah, so th this is the, the slide <clears throat> that uh, I used the last time, which essentially says uh, how many uh, prefix references we have of which kind. Um, so it's, it's 32 plus 1496 plus plus uh, a number that I have no idea where it came from. It's probably two to the 18 or something like that. I have to look it up again. Um, so um, yeah, th that needs uh, some some more thinking, but I thought before I, I put energy into that thinking, I should have a corpus to look at. So that, that's just a reminder from last time. Next slide. So um, going to the table setup, um, again, I, I hope that the, the actual packing can get stable relatively soon. And the, the table setup one we want to do uh, should be simple. And, and we should keep in mind that there will be application-specific versions of that. Um, and uh, we need to provide a framework for the table setup because uh, uh, yeah, otherwise the, the actual unpackers uh, will need to to be very different for, for each of those. So we, we should give some guidance for how this table setup uh, uh, stuff works. So basically what, what I'm proposing here is that um, in a CBOR structure uh, for, for every data item in there, so the, the total data item and all the subtrees, there is a table setup that applies to that data item. And normally it just inherits uh, through the, the tree. And the default table setup, of course, is three empty tables. <clears throat> Actually, if, if there is any reason to put something there that, that is really useful for any kind of CBOR, then we could do it in the default, put it into the default table, but I didn't find anything uh, for that. But maybe again, that's just lack of imagination. So th there is a default table setup, and uh, then um, I expect <coughs> that, that uh, different application environments will uh, define uh, different um, table setups that, that are applied to the root of the data items uh, defined by the, the media types for that application environment. Um, so just like we, we in SIP compression, we had this uh, SIP uh, static dictionary, um, we would have a static dictionary for, for a specific um, application. So that's one thing, or it would be the, the table would be overridden or, or um, augmented by uh, tags that are in the uh, structure. And the, the um, previous version just had such a tag at the root. And uh, I'm, I'm proposing to open this up and say it could be anywhere, uh, but uh, that that's maybe only something that you allow if there is some, some if the CBOR data item is, is likely to be uh, the, the result of some composition. So normally you would still have just a single uh, tag at the root. And uh, the, the document uh, provides one of those, the basic packed CBOR, uh, which essentially uh, provides a way to include three and closed tables that will be prepended to the tables that are already apply to it. So if the, the media type says um, you have these five keywords, uh, you would be able to put in another set of uh, keywords and that would be prepended. So it would get the better uh, places. And um, yeah, th 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 there is some 
there, there are some ideas how to do this differently, but uh, the, the basic approach and the one used by this basic pack table would be to always prepend them because the specific document, specific data item knows better how to use these than the, the static dictionary provided uh, to it. So, um, <clears throat> the, the, given that this is just prepending things, uh, everything else moves up the numbering space and uh, get, potentially gets longer uh, uh, tags and, and longer uh, reference. Um, so you would, uh, in a static dictionary, try to sort things uh, by frequency, but th that's already the natural way of doing a static dictionary, so th that's not really a big surprise here. So one thing we, we did next slide, one thing we did discuss last time was that actually the, the, there are not increasingly worse positions in that number space, but we have different buckets. So the first 16 numbers are actually all the same, and then the next 48 are all the same, and the next 512 are all the same, and so on. Uh, so maybe there is a good reason to actually use this structure to define alternative insertion points. So you don't necessarily insert at, at the uh, start, maybe you insert into the next bucket. So the, I, I didn't write anything in the document how this could be done, because that would be the job of the specific uh, tags to do that. <clears throat> but it, it's an idea that, that probably should be said, so when people implement this, they, they know that tags might be defined that do that. Okay, so that, that's the bucket idea. Next slide. Um, what I would like to do next is uh, uh, look at this O1 draft, answer the issues that are uh, in there and, and generate a, a dash O2 and then see whether we um, actually uh, can use that already or whether we, we need to cook it uh, some more. So my hope would be that we can uh, cook this without completing the definition of all application-specific tags that we will ever need to define uh, for, for packing. Uh, so people can start defining their application-specific tags a little bit later. But we probably sh should already discuss uh, the usage of packing in the specific application environments. So, for instance, for the suit people, uh, we would see how, how would that have been used in the suit environment. Unfortunately, they, they had to define, define their own little application-specific a scheme for this because uh, we were too late with, with this. Uh, but in, in other application environments that need this, we would also start discussion about how, how would we ap apply this here. Is this something that you, you even want to have in that application environment? And if yes, how would you make uh, use of that? And what application-specific setup tags would you define beyond the basic uh, packed CBO? And, and how would you define your static dictionary if, if uh, something like that can be uh, defined? Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Karsten. Um, very good and thorough presentation. I agree with your hunch that prefixes are more likely to be in common and important than suffixes, and also the run length of prefixes is uh, likely to be quite a lot longer than suffixes, as they're pieces of URIs, for instance, often. Thank you. I have some questions, Carson, about your, I guess, 2.2 .2 and 2.3 table. Yes. These haven't really been updated yet. So, yes, go ahead. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, so I was trying this uh, press space bar to talk, and I guess I didn't do it right. Um, <clears throat> so in table one, there's a negative integer n. Um, yes. And I guess that's a tag applied to a negative number. And of course, we have, and I don't understand um, for n larger than eight, it gives us a negative element number. And I don't know what that means based on the example and stuff. No, because the, the, the integer n is negative, the result is always positive. Oh, of course. All right, that makes much more sense. Okay, <clears throat> so does there should that, be some examples there? Yeah. So doesn't that overlap with the positive numbers then? Oh, oh, because, because, they're, they're, because they're alternating positive, yes. negative, positive, negative. Okay, I understand that. So it, this is this is uh, the zigzag encoding that Google pioneered in in Photobuff. Right. All right. Great. Okay, the second question I don't understand is in the table two, the suffix reference. Okay, um, so there's a TBD. So I'm I'm not understand. I, I guess that I'm trying to understand how that works, and I also don't understand why tag six uh, suffix has element number zero and nothing else. I, I don't. I guess I'm not comprehending how that fits in. Yes, exactly. Thank you for putting that up. <clears throat> Like tag yeah. six is special in the thing in the encoding, but why? What is it tagging? It's tagging the the rump actually. So if you have something that you really use a lot, then you have a one byte referent that you can use around a rump to uh, reference suffix. Excuse me. Prefix oh. uh, value zero. <clears throat> oh, I see. So you basically put this on the, okay, you tag the rest of your data and that becomes the, okay, I understand now. The text tried to do that, but I didn't get that. We'll need an example. <clears throat> yeah. Um, also, a review, a more, more, uh, more uh, precise review will be really, really good for improving the text. Mind. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if, we'll, we'll, if you uh, can see what was not clear or what was missing, I I, I agree. Yes. Um, I I feel I also have some confusion, um, about the encoding, um, and and, and so this refers to the two point two referencing shared items. So we have a simple value zero to fifteen, and yet twenty four is usually an important number in CVOR. <laughs> is that because we've just omitted eight numbers or <coughs> is there some other thing I don't get about the encoding? So for the first 16 element numbers, uh, you have a simple value. So you have a single byte encoding. For the ne next 48 element numbers, you have tag six and a single byte integer. So from minus 24 to plus 23, if you plug these numbers into the formula that is there, you get the element number 16 to 63. How do I know that element numbers zero through 15, they say simple value zero to 15. So that means like, that would that normally be an integer then? Well, the, the the encoding is a simple value, and that that encodes an integer, which is an unsigned integer, which is the index in the shared item array. So the the whole point of of the table is to to map the element number space, space which is the um, set of unsigned integers, uh, to map that into efficient ways of encoding it in, in CBOR. And for the first 16, we can just 
allocate half of the simple value uh, space. And for the next 48, uh, we can use the, the single byte numbers uh, plus a tag around those. So we have a two byte encoding. And then, of course, we have a three byte encoding for the next 512 and, and, and so on and so on. Actually, it's not 512, it's 448 or something. Yeah, so we need a few examples. <laughs> I completely yeah. agree with that. Okay, I forgot that the simple values was not what was that, that part and that there's a bunch of unencoded. So that's major type seven right so that's yes. what i forgot that it was called that there was were floating point numbers and simple values and so we had a, a four byte four bits of of unallocated space there okay that that already sets a few good action points um on the on the topic of what to talk about next um is there i mean Discriminated unions are still on the list. Um, do you think that there is much more to be gained from continuing this discussion? Because otherwise, I'd suggest we move on to the discriminated unions. Well, I'll take all the feedback I can get uh, for this. Um, so uh, my plan is to have a, a next version of this draft uh, pretty quickly. So please... Uh, keep those pull requests coming. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. then maybe it, it should be easier to read and we can circulate it a little bit more widely so uh, people can, can uh, uh, application developers can, can start commenting on it and so on. Yeah. So Michael, I, I wrote down for you to possibly review the document or send comments in the mailing list if you have time since you already had some yeah um <clears throat> i'll try to recap them but <clears throat> yeah uh i'll have to, it, it, i would have to be doing have to be figuring out how to write the code but maybe that's next step i would say that's actually yes. one other important next step. Uh, I should be cleaning up my implementation and, and putting that somewhere. That would be very much appreciated, yes. The, the problem with implementing this, of course, is that there are a million ways to do this. And uh, I probably just do a really stupid compressor. Um, so it's easier to see what, what the, the standardized parts of this are. Yeah, but then again, that's something that we could still improve and improve later on. And Well, th that's really something where, where people can pour uh, infinite amounts of secret sauce over the thing because we don't have to standardize the compressor. We're yeah. standardizing the decompressor. Good. Yeah, let's um, good. Let's move on to a discriminated unions. I hope my browser survives this. Um, and still, Carsten. Yeah. So th this is one of the uh, the items that came in from implementers, and uh, actually, it, it's a good example of the usage of Seabor in a language environment. Uh, so just as, as uh, Michael, you, you mentioned Surly in, in Rust, um, there are other people who are using Seabor for their language runtime support. And um, many language environments actually need something like this. And traditionally, they all have defined their own things. So, so Python has uh, Pickle and uh, uh, Perl and Ruby have marshalling and, and everybody has their own thing. And at some point, for instance, the Haskell people decided they don't really need to invent another one of those. Uh, so they, they went for, for Seabor. 
And um, they came back and said, oh, we have this, this need for uh, discriminated uh, unions. So they actually came a while ago. They, they needed a time tag. And this is what uh, turned into tag 1001. Uh, and uh, we already have tag 27, which was motivated by Pearl and so on. So that, that's going to be a subgenre of, of uh, uh, seaboard tech development, uh, making sure that, that uh, language environments can do something useful uh, with seaboard. Uh, so this is not coming from the protocol development side, uh, but from the language environment uh, side. Next slide. Um, so the, the uh, specific gap that was identified here uh, was that that on one hand it's really easy to to express a union type in in SIBO uh, uh, because SIBO is a schemaless uh, encoding. So uh, if you need a union, well, you just put uh, whatever you want to put there in, into your data item, and and you are done. So SIBO the, the doesn't need any support uh, for unions, um, but the problem is um, this only covers actual unions where, where the uh, values of, of the contributing types uh, all are uh, on their own, standalone, meaningful values of the union type. But sometimes you, you don't have that. So you, you need numbers somewhere, but uh, you need to say whether that number is actually a house number or a post office box number. And in that case, just writing um, some address component can be a house number or a post office box number it doesn't help you. You need to be able to discriminate uh, the various branches, the various alternatives uh, of that uh, union. That's where, where discriminators come in. If we actually um, write protocols, then we usually define labels for those discriminators. So we, we often set up maps and discriminate uh, the various cases by, by having different uh, labels. But th that's not necessarily what we would find in a programming language. And what we have on slide four here is an example from a programming language. And I think that's Haskell, actually. I have to check that. Um, but it looks very much like Haskell. Um, so uh, here we have uh, a, a type called expert, and this actually is a discriminated union with uh, six uh, branches, and the terms lit at sub neg mal div are actually the discriminators. So they identify which of the, the choices are actually taken, and uh, the, the things behind that, the int, expert, expert, and so on, these are the the content of the discriminated units. So that, that's the data that come with that specific uh, choice. So that's what the Haskell compiler would see as input. And, and next slide. Um, the Haskell compiler really would like to translate this into something like this, uh, where uh, you have uh, discriminators that look like tags, uh, which are put on the actual parameters uh, for that specific alternative. So you would have tag zero uh, for the, the lit case and tag one for the add case um, and so on. So th th there is no point in carrying um, lit and, and add and so on as, as strings uh, because th this is all done by a compiler which knows what, what's going on here. Um, so we're not going to do the, the JSON thing here. Um, and uh, actually, um, yeah, we, we really would like to have integers here in a tag-like uh, construct. And if this looks familiar, uh, after looking at CBOPEC, yes, this is kind of fam familiar, but it, it's a very different uh, application. So of course, if, if we ever come into a situation where we would define a protocol, uh, we would probably define tags for addition, subtraction, uh, and so on. But again, this is the compiler. The compiler doesn't want to reach out to IANA and register these tags. The compiler just wants a pool of tags uh, it can use. Next slide. So what the compiler really wants to, to generate is something like this. 
and that requires some uh, predefined tags uh, that can be used. And the current proposal is to register seven one plus one tags because that's really the the vast majority of all discriminated unions have seven or less uh, choices. And then 2048, one plus two tags, and then a catch all uh, that will provide uh, anything up to 64 bit uh, uh, tag numbers. So, this is all written up in this not yet submitted draft that, that is on GitHub uh, right now. And if you are interested in this uh, subject, please have a look. So um, I have some, some co-authors uh, with whom I, I want to finish the text of this uh, and, and submit this in, in the next couple of weeks uh, so we can see whether the working group is interested in, in uh, taking on this tag or whether this uh, should be something that is an individual submission or just goes into the registry and so on. That, that's what I, what I would like to figure out. Just for for a brief preliminary gauging, um, has anyone read the the pre-draft yet? Well, this is the first time I have shown it to anyone, so <laughs> I would be surprised. Okay. <laughs> but sometimes people look at my GitHub repository and find interesting things there. But uh, yeah, basically, what have been from are following you on GitHub, and then they get this notification cool stuff. <laughs> But yes, I saw fly by. I was like, "Oh, unit's cool," and that's done. <laughs> okay, but please, 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 have, please have looks so that we could have more informed, um, a bit more for discussion next time because we're running out of time today anyway for any more discussion. So I think we should go right to to any other business parts. Um, anything and anyone wants to bring up? So before we close, I just wanted to thank Barry for all his work as AD, and I'm looking forward to, to uh, I hope I can do a good job as your follow, uh, following AD. But thank you so much, Barry. Thank you. And thanks from, th thanks from me too. Um, also to you for giving me the giving me the the introductions and kind of getting me in here. I think that's it for today. Um, we'll reconvene in two weeks. Minutes will be posted. Our recordings should be up around next week. Um, thank you all for for your input and everything you've prepared. And see you then. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.